Okay. All right. So morning, everybody. All right. So we're going to carry on with our series about the ultrasound. And uh, I think for those of you who may have seen last week, we started talking about what you look at when you're looking at uh, a cardiac ultrasound as part of the eFAST exam, right? And then there were some videos we posted about the guy with the query stab heart and guy with the stab in the back and things like that, all right? So we just, uh, and don't stress, when I see you looking at me with big eyes, what the is this dude talking about, yeah? Listen, if you're on the group, you knew, like I think I just added you yesterday, go back on the media section and you'll see there's a whole lot of uh, lectures about ECGs, ultrasound, you can watch it at your own pace, all right? And then just catch up, all right? But uh, for those who've been uh, following from the beginning, then, uh, you know, this is now the next part of it, all right? So the thing is, when we're assessing the heart in the EFAST exam, sometimes it's very difficult to get that sub xiphoid window. In other words, to look from the heart. Sometimes the patient may be in pain. It's a difficult view because you have to push it right down and then try and push up. The patient may just be large in size. You just can't get that go into that area. Sometimes there's like, um, I think the video we posted the other day, actually because of, because of the guy's hemothorax, we actually couldn't see the heart properly. So what it means is you can't say, okay, I can't see the heart, that's the end of it, I can't look at it. There's four views that we use to look at the heart. Now the two other views we'll get to a bit later, but this is the second one and the easier one to look at while you are, um, what you might call it, uh, during, during that e-fast exam, right? But just to remind the reason why we're looking at that cardiac window, we're looking for a pericardial effusion, right? Pericardial effusion tells us a lot about output and tells us a lot about the heart itself, right? Uh, we're gonna get to, you know, some other things, but the main thing that we're looking for is uh, pericardial effusions at the moment, okay? So this is what we call the parasternal long axis, okay? Come sit, don't worry. Okay, so it's the parasternal long axis, okay? So why we call it the long axis is because it's placed on the heart in this way. This is how your probe sits, all right? So you can see where the indicator is, okay? Uh, I think it is placed here. Have a seat, all right? So when we started this lecture series, you guys will remember, we always talked about putting the indicator on the right-hand side or towards the head, right? And you can see now we're placing the indicator on the complete opposite side. In fact, we're facing it towards the patient's left elbow, right? The reason for doing that, right? So this is where your indicator is, right? It's just so that when we see the heart, we see the heart in a view that's a bit easier for us to understand, okay? So what's here, where the probe is, is the apex of the heart, okay? So that corresponds to this side, okay? Simply because of how the human brain works, okay? This is a bit easier. Now you can put it the other way, that's no problem. It's just that it will become a mirror image, okay? But I, I'm just showing this to you just so that it makes a bit of sense. So we're slicing the heart in this direction, okay? We're slicing the heart in this direction. So what we see at the top is, uh, that's our probe. That's the, 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 what you call it, the indicator on that side. And the indicator looks towards the apex, all right? This is the front of the chest wall. This is the back of the chest wall, okay? So when we look down at the heart, essentially what we are doing is we're looking from the top down. So if I can describe it, it's sort of like putting a camera from there right at the top and looking down this way, if I can put it that way. Uh, let's say a bit more from the front, okay? You're looking down through my heart in that direction, okay? So that's what you're kind of seeing. So you're seeing the apex and then you see the right ventricle, all right, here at the top. So the right ventricle is the small little thing that's pumping away over there, okay. So what this will tell you immediately is that this view is not very good at looking at the, the right ventricle, okay. Then at the back, we see the left ventricle, okay, which is now corresponding to there. The right ventricle is here. There's the right and left ventricle there. We see the left ventricle. We see the valve between the left atrium and the right ventricle, which is called the Everybody keeps quiet now. What's it called? Mitral valve, very good. Okay. So the one on the other side is called the tricuspid valve. All right. And what we're actually seeing over here is the start of the aorta as well. Okay. Now, if you get a very good view, you can even see the aortic valve over there, but we can't see it too well here. But this is what we are looking for. So we're looking for the right ventricle, left ventricle, left atrium. 
and this is the musculature, the myocardium, and this is the pericardium over here. All right. This little thing that we see over here is the descending aorta. Okay. Uh, the descending aorta are not so important today, but just so that you know, you should be seeing this on this view. All right. Now, this is a very lovely view. The reason why this view looks so lovely, this has been done with a, what they call a phased array probe, which is a tiny little thing like that that fits in between the rib spaces. And for those of you who've seen our machine, our uh, probe is about that big, all right? So what happens is with our probe, we tend to get a lot of rib shadows, okay? But that doesn't mean you can't see this. It just means you've kind of got a maneuver in between, okay? Now, if you go down, uh, have any of you met Nokwanda yet? Our echo cardio, echo technician. Okay, if you have a chance one day, you're really, really bored. Like you've got literally nothing else to do. Take a walk down toward 1A to the echo lab and uh, you'll see Nokwanda with her machine, all right? Similar to ours, but it's got this phased array, cardiac probe, all right? And you must see when she does these as well, okay? It's quite advanced and it's quite a bit that they do, okay? It's just, just for interest sake, it's, it's worth seeing. Okay. All right, so now we know what we should be seeing, all right? Let's have a look and see. So this is just a more detailed illustration of what we're looking at, all right? So like we say, we've still got the right ventricle over there, which corresponds to that picture, all right? We've got the left ventricle and the septum, all right? So the septum, the left ventricle, inferior wall. You've got your mitral valve sitting over there. You can, and if you do a, a, a good one, you can see the, whatchamacallit, the, 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 the papillary muscles and the quarter tendine, all of that as well. And the left atrium, and you can see the aortic valve. So that's the aortic valve over there, right? So this is what I was trying to explain earlier. So these are the slices that we take. So we're slicing in that direction. This is the hardest part of ultrasound is actually to orientate yourself, to know what you are looking at and from what direction, because we always assume this is the top, this is the bottom, this is the front, this is the back, but it depends on where you actually put your probe. And unfortunately it only comes with practice. Okay, so that's why I keep on telling you guys, I see that machine is still just sits in the corner. It needs to come out from there. You guys need to start putting it on patients and start practicing, all right? It can't just be, oh no, there's a patient, call Dr. Mohammed. No, 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 you go, you practice, and then you call me and I'll tell you what to do, okay? All right, so that's basically what we're trying to look at, okay? So that's just an illustrated version of it, okay? So what you're gonna see now is we're going to see uh, just a short video on how we should place this uh, probe, all right? Hopefully. It's going to play. A phased array transducer with a cardiac exam type is used to perform the parasternal long axis view of the heart. If possible, place the patient in a left lateral decubitus position to reduce any lung artifact and to bring the heart closer to the anterior chest wall. Place the transducer at the third or fourth intercostal space immediately left of the sternum. Move between the third and fourth intercostal space and slide the transducer toward and away from the sternum to identify the optimal scanning window. Assuming the long axis of the heart to be positioned on a plane from the patient's right shoulder to left hip, rotate the transducer to adjust for the body habitus of the patient. The orientation marker will be at approximately the 10 o'clock position. As an alternative approach, this exam may be performed using an abdomen exam type with the orientation marker to the patient's right side at approximately the four o'clock position. The myocardium will appear gray and the blood-filled chambers will appear hypoechoic. The descending aorta is seen in cross-section as a round structure posterior to the atrioventricular junction. This view is used to evaluate the right ventricle, left ventricle outflow tract, and left ventricle. Note overall activity of the heart, any wall motion abnormality, valve abnormalities, and the presence of pericardial effusion. Just a, a more practical example so you can see where you need to put it, but it's essentially just saying that. All right. uh, if one of you for some reason has to visit a cardiologist in, in the next few days, they place it the other way around. There's a few reasons for that, but don't suddenly look at your cardiologist and think, oh God, this guy is stupid, or this lady is stupid. No, they've got their reasons why they do that, all right? But in the emergency department, we put it in this direction. We've also got our reasons, okay? Uh, it's not because we don't like them, but that's just how it is, okay? 
So uh, this is another video just showing again cardio echo and what we're supposed to be looking at. All right. Let's take a look at the images that we'll obtain by performing the parasternal long axis view of the heart. Here's a nice pictorial to the left, and what we see is that the most superficial structure will be the right ventricle. Notice that the right atrium is not seen from this plane. Directly posterior to the right ventricle will be the left ventricle, and to the right of the left ventricle will be seen the left atrium. We can also see the mitral valve in between the left atrium and the left ventricle, and a little bit of the aorta above the left atrium. Let's look at the ultrasound still image here to the right, and again we see the superficial right ventricle. Posterior, we see the left ventricle with its more muscular and hypertrophic walls. Notice the left atrium as seen to the right of the left ventricle and the mitral valve in between the two chambers. We categorize this as left ventricular inflow tract. Note the aortic valve sitting right above the left atrium, and we see a little bit of the aortic root there. This is what we categorize as aortic outflow tract. Let's now take a look at the parasternal long axis view of the heart in action. Remember again that the most superficial chamber will be the right ventricle, and the normal dimensions of the right ventricle are that it should be about half the size of the left ventricle. If the right ventricle is the same size of the left ventricle, that could be a sign of RV strain. We see the left ventricle posterior to the right ventricle. Note its hypertrophic walls. This patient actually had long-standing hypertension. Let's look at the percentage change from diastole through systole, and here we see that the walls come in well with each heartbeat, indicating good contractility. We see the left atrium to the right of the left ventricle, and notice the mitral valve flipping up and down in between the left atrium and the left ventricle. We see here good movement of the mitral valve, indicating a good amount of blood flowing between the left atrium and the left ventricle. Now just above the left atrium and to the right of the left ventricle, we see the aortic valve. And notice there, just to the right of the aortic valve, a little bit of the diamond-shaped aortic root. This will be our, our left ventricular outflow tract. Now another very important structure to identify on bedside sonography is the descending aorta, which is a cylinder cut in cross-section right below the mitral valve, as seen in this image. This is a very important landmark because the posterior pericardial reflection, that white line seen posterior to the left ventricle, comes off anterior to the descending aorta. This allows us to tell if the fluid that we see there may be pericardial or pleural. So that's just again giving you a, 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 a the reason why I'm concentrating on what looks normal is because particularly with the heart, if you don't know what looks normal, you'll never know what looks abnormal. Okay. So, you know, these are important things just to concentrate on. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, one more video. All right. Um, Here's a video clip showing excellent contractility of the left ventricle as taken from a medical student triathlete. Recall the chambers of the heart as taken from the parasternal long axis plane, the left atrium as seen in a posterior location, the mitral valve just to the left of the left atrium, and the left ventricle as seen with its hypertrophic walls. Notice the strong contractility of this left ventricle as the endocardial walls almost meet during systole. We see the aortic valve to the right of the left ventricle and the right ventricle in a superficial location above the left ventricle. Recall the descending aorta, the cylinder cut in cross-section just posterior to the left atrium. And note the posterior pericardial reflection coming off just anterior to the descending aorta and posterior to the left ventricle. And with a small indicator arrow, I'll trace out the posterior pericardial reflection. Note here the absence of any dark or anechoic fluid collections. Now let's contrast that last video clip with this one taken from a patient with an advanced cardiomyopathy. We recall the left ventricle and the right ventricle in a superficial location above the LV. Notice the very poor percentage change of the endocardial walls of the left ventricle during systole, indicating a very decreased ejection fraction. Here's a clip taken from a patient who presented with a transplanted heart and acute shortness of breath. We'll begin by identifying the descending aorta, as shown here to the bottom part of the picture. Note the posterior pericardial reflection, that white line coming off just anterior to the descending aorta. But what we see here is the presence of a dark fluid collection, a pericardial effusion that layers out posteriorly above the posterior pericardial reflection and comes anteriorly to surround the heart. With a small indicator arrow, I'll point to the anterior portion of the pericardial effusion and note the chaotic movement of the right ventricle as shown here. This is indicative of early tamponade or high pressures within the pericardial sac. 
Here's a video clip showing a potential mimic of a pericardial effusion. Let's begin by identifying that descending aorta as a cylinder cut and cross section posterior to the left atrium. And we identify the posterior pericardium as shown here coming off just anterior to the descending aorta. Note the presence here of a large dark or anechoic fluid collection, but note that it layers out posteriorly there to the pericardium. Thus, this fluid is within the pleural cavity and not within the pericardial cavity. With a small indicator arrow, I'm again reinforcing the pericardial reflection and the presence of the fluid within the thoracic cavity, a pleural effusion. Next, we'll look at a video clip from a patient who presented with acute shortness of breath requiring intubation. First, we'll begin by identifying the descending aorta, then the posterior pericardial reflection. Note here the presence of fluid both within the pericardial sac, as shown here layering anterior to the pericardium, and posteriorly within the pleural cavity, layering out just below the pericardial reflection. Why, you might ask, does the patient have all this fluid? Well, let's look closely at the mitral valve, and on the posterior mitral valve leaflet, we see a calcified vegetation. This patient, in fact, had an infected dialysis catheter with mitral valve endocarditis, and had developed wide open mitral valve regurgitation resulting in heart failure and all the fluid layering out within the pericardium and the thoracic cavity. The first time you do a peritoneal long axis, you don't have to diagnose something like that, all right? But the important thing is that you can recognize something is wrong. Okay? So once you can start recognizing these pericardial effusions and pleural effusions and things like that, it makes your life a lot easier as well. And especially the contractility when it comes to our CCF patients, our patients with low BPs, which we're going to get to in a little while, you know. So, you know, when we read these fancy echo reports about ejection fractions and we all go, wow, how did they pick that up? They're basically just looking at how much this contracts. That's it. It literally takes one or 10 seconds once you know how to do it. Okay. So don't stress. As you get more and more experience, you start realizing things are quite simple. They're not as complex as they appear to be. All right. So. Uh, okay, so that's just reminding you of what the sub xiphoid view looks like. All right, let me see if there is anything else on here. Sorry, right there we go. So, here we're going to try and have a look at a few. So, here we have a hyperdynamic heart. All right, I just wanted to contrast the two for you. Okay, so a hyperdynamic heart patient who might be uh, hypovolemic or something like that. Can you notice the difference? Can you tell me the difference between the two? if you were just looking at this. So this is a heart that's working too hard. This is a heart that's not working hard enough, all right? So the first thing that you notice, number one, in the left ventricle, the thickness of that wall, all right? But notice how the walls collapse in on one another. So in other words, every time the left ventricle beats, the two walls go against one another. Right? That's an ejection fraction of 100%. That means it's closing 100%, okay? So it's trying to push out as much as possible. So there's a few reasons for that. Number one, there may be something obstructing it, or there may not be enough fluid entering there. So it's trying to push out as much as possible, or it's being constricted from the outside. So let's say there's constrictive pericarditis or something like that. So something's not allowing it to expand. So it's trying to catch up by doing that, All right? Sort of like emptying a bath. If you take it with a bucket, you do it slowly. But if you need to empty it with a spoon, you've got to do that, All right? So those are the things that happen. And then you have a look at this heart here. And what's the first thing that you notice about this left ventricle? Not all together now, just one at a time. <laughs> Poor contractility, very good, all right. So can you see, the main thing is that the heart walls are hardly coming together, all right. So what do you think the ejection fraction of this patient is? Just by looking at it, far less, far less than 50. All right, far less than 50. Look at how, uh, well, basically during diastole, so when the heart is at rest, that's when it's at its widest, all right? So if we could, well, we can't pause this one, but if we could, you could see it. And uh, the, the minimum distance is when it's in systole. So actually, this is very, very low. It's probably less than 10% or close to 10% because it's basically doing that, all right? 50% would be something like that, all right? But, and 100% is completely closed. So this is like hardly moving hardly anything happening, all right? So that's how we can tell the difference, okay? So let's look at another one. So what do we think is happening here? Very good, why do you say it's a pericardial effusion? Okay, and you use what? Very good, excellent. So the descending aorta, okay, 
that's for sure. Does this picture look a bit strange to you? Yeah, because this was done by a cardiologist, so it's done the other way around. Okay, so that's why I say don't, it's just the cardiology view, okay, but it's still a pericardial effusion, okay. And this one here, what do you see? What do you notice? This is the view that we were looking at before. What do you notice? No, this is the normal view. Sorry, I'm just looking at it the wrong way around. What do you see here? Also, pericardial effusion, isn't it? Just a little bit smaller, okay. Why, why I put these here is because you have to understand that you may not get the same view every time, okay. You may not necessarily see it exactly like how you saw it uh, the time before that. Sorry. All right. So in other words, you've got to be able to scan through and look through the whole heart. Don't expect to always recognize every structure immediately. It depends on the probe that you're using, your experience levels, the patient's body habitus, um, what you might call it, um, room shadowing. There's quite a bit that comes into it. And these are very good examples because they're done with a proper probe. You'll see when we do it on hours at some point, how difficult it can be. Okay. Uh, sorry. I'm not sure why it's displaying like that. Uh, okay, I just won't worry about that one here. Uh, let's just rather concentrate on this one here. So this is actually just showing hy hypertrophy. Okay, hypertrophy of the muscle. Okay, uh, this was supposed to be a video clip showing you something else, but uh, don't stress about it. I'm not sure why it's displaying like that. But this was just to show you what hypertrophic heart muscle looks like. All right. So when we talk about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or left ventricular hypertrophy, this is what it looks like. All right. So contrast it to, let's say, this heart. Okay. Look at the thickness of the walls, okay, of the septum and of the left ventricular wall, even here when you look at it. And then you come across to this one and you see how thick these are. Okay. Now, the specific measurements that we use, but we don't have to do that in the emergency department, but it's something that we can suspect and ask an echo technician or a cardiologist to have a look at and say, okay, you know what, work it out exactly how much it is. Because it may be 1% over borderline, 1% less. That's not our job to work out. Our job is to work out what's going on right now and why this patient may be in pain. Okay. So pericardiocentesis, specifically when you've got pericardial tamponade, Let's have a look and see. Here's an example of a small pericardial effusion. In this particular effusion, there's no evidence of pericardial tamponade, which is, of course, the thing we are most concerned about and the reason for performing a pericardiocentesis. Pericardial tamponade can be visualized on ultrasound, but it's not 100% sensitive. So if a patient has a good clinical presentation in the presence of an effusion, you really have to worry about tamponade until proven otherwise. When we think about pericardial tamponade with ultrasound, there's three things that we look for. The first and probably the most important is right ventricular collapse. This is an example of right ventricular collapse from a pericardial effusion causing tamponade. Here we see the free wall of the right ventricle is collapsing during diastole. The next thing we look for is the presence of a collapsed LV. So we think that if the patient has a reduction in forward flow because of collapsing of their right ventricle, the LV is therefore not filling. This makes the LV hyperdynamic, meaning that the walls touch during systole. So this patient, for example, has an ejection fraction of approximately 100% because the LV walls are touching during systole. This is because the LV is not filling appropriately because of the lack of forward flow coming from the right side of the heart. The last thing we're looking for is a dilated IVC. If someone doesn't have appropriate forward flow because of lack of filling of the right side of their heart, we expect the blood to back up into the inferior vena cava. To look at this, we're looking at a subcostal window. This is a subcostal long axis window, and you see the effusion here. Here we see the liver, and the IVC is nice, fat, and dilated, and not collapsing at all with respiratory variation, telling me that there is a significant uh, reduction in forward flow. To perform a pericardiocentesis with ultrasound, you're going to need a couple of things. The first and mo most important is obviously the ultrasound machine, and we can use either the curvilinear abdominal probe if we're performing a subcostal technique, or we can use the thoracic probe or the cardiac probe if we're performing a uh, apical technique or with the subcostal technique. Of course, you'll also want a pericardiocentesis tray. Now, you don't have to have one of these. If you're not placing a catheter, you can simply use a spinal needle and a large syringe. However, if you do want to place a catheter, I recommend you keep a pericardiocentesis tray in your emergency department. 
There's two particular windows that we use when we perform a pericardiocentesis under ultrasound guidance. That's the subcostal window, which is the more classic window performed usually without ultrasound guidance, and then the apical window, which has gained a good bit of popularity uh, since the use of ultrasound for guiding this procedure. Some people also use a peristernal technique going in the third or fourth intercostal space. However, I prefer not to use this due to the location of the left anterior descending artery. Uh, the concept of lacerating that artery just sort of scares me. This is an example of performing an ultrasound guided pericardiocentesis from the subcostal window. The steps that we mention here are pretty much the same steps that you would use for the apical window, the only difference being the orientation of the ultrasound probe. For this particular example, we're using a curvilinear abdominal probe, or we could also use, use the thoracic or phased array probe for this particular image. Here we see we're looking at a heart with a fairly significant di diastolic uh, collapse of the right ventricle and a fairly large effusion. We're going to be coming through the liver here, and we're actually visualizing the, visualizing the pericardium through the liver here. I'm going to insert the needle just lateral to the probe to the patient's right side. That way I'll be going through the liver and towards the patient's pericardial sac. <laughs> As I insert the needle and draw back, I'll get a flash of blood into the syringe. Once I've seen this blood, I'm going to confirm that it appears my needle tip is in my pericardium. After I do that, I'll take the syringe off and I'll place a wire through the needle into the pericardial sac, again confirming that the wire is in the pericardial sac and not the ventricle. I'll use ultrasound for this confirmation. Then I'll slide a dilator over the wire and finally pass a catheter over the wire and remove the wire. At this point, I can place the wire to down drain to drain the pericardial effusion. Here's an example of a real-time performed pericardial effusion. Here we're using the phased array probe from a subcostal window and you can see the needle coming in just about right here. We see we've popped through the pericardium and once we pop through the pericardium we're going to start advancing our wire down. You can see the wire pushing down on the right ventricular free wall here as it goes into the pericardial sac. After the wire, we'll of course pr push the dilator over the wire. Here we see the dilator coming in. And then finally, the catheter will be placed over the wire into the pericardial sac. Once the catheter is in place and it's hooked up to down drain, you can actually see the pericardial effusion diminish in size. And here we can see that pericardial effusion getting much smaller. In addition to the subcostal window, you can also use the apical four-chamber window. For this particular window, I'll again place the needle just lateral to the probe. However, this time, I'm going to come from a medial orientation directed towards the apex of the heart. I'll again be able to see virtually the same thing that we saw with the last image. However, we'll of course use the phased array probe in this instance because it's much easier to visualize through the rib spaces with a phased array probe rather than with a curved linear. A few tips and tricks. So agitated saline is a great technique for making sure that you're actually in the pericardial sac as opposed to placing the needle or the wire into a ventricle. Here's an example of injecting agitated saline into the pericardium once you have the needle in what you believe is the pericardium. You can see how the agitated saline lights up and is extremely hyperechoic in the pericardial sac here. If we were inside a ventricle, say the left ventricle for example, we would see the left ventricle light up as opposed to remaining dark here. Agitated saline can be a great way to confirm that you're in the right location, especially if you're trying to tap a small pericardial effusion or if you're just not very comfortable with placing a large dilator into a ventricle. Needle in plane technique. Some people talk about using the needle out of plane technique, which would mean going through, going with the needle through the center of the probe. However, I prefer having the needle come in laterally so that we have the needle in plane and in view the entire time. This allows us to see the needle tip and really know where it is in space. So I'll have the needle come in just lateral to the probe, and then that way I know where to expect it on my screen. I would expect the needle coming in just here laterally going towards the pericardial sac. Again, I'm going to have the needle actually come in right next to the probe marker. That way I know to expect the needle coming from the probe marker as seen here. Go where the fluid is. It's important to remember that with pericardiocentesis there are no margin for error as possible. So wherever the pericardial effusion is the thickest is probably where you should go with your needle. If that happens to be peristernal, even though Malin said don't do it on his little podcast, go for it. Whatever you think, whatever you're most comfortable with. So apical, subcostal, peristernal, wherever that effusion is the largest is probably going to give you the best chance of success without taking out a ventricle and placing a catheter in someone's aorta. <laughs> It's a nice technique to know, 
it's good to experience it, but I can tell you that even up to now, if I have to do a pericardiocentesis, I still sweat, because you never know what's going to happen. No, seriously. I mean, I've been, teach I've been teaching this for five years now, right? Not just doing them, but teaching them for five years. And when I've got to put that probe and do it, I'm always scared what's going to happen. So these are nice things for you guys to know. I'm not saying now go rush out and start doing pericardiocentesis every time you see a little pericardial effusion. There has to be a reason why we are doing it. And the main reason is once there's uh, evidence of severe cardiac tamponade, right? So any, any idea what's the signs of physical of severe to cardiac tamponade? Yeah, what's Beck's triad? Very good. Very good, right? Yes, that's 100%, right? As well as muffled heart sounds, all of that, you know? So basically your patient's about to die because there's so much of pressure being placed on that heart that it can no longer expand and contract. So by removing the fluid around you, allow it to go back to normal, right? So it's not just for everybody who's got a bit of a pericardial effusion from CCF and things like that. And uh, even though we showed this video last week, I just wanted to show it again just to reinforce, okay? And it doesn't work too well with stab hearts because it tends to, blood tends to clot, all right? But in TB pericarditis, I um, mean, pericardial effusion, there's a lot of ways that we can use it, right? I don't think there's any more. That's about it. So um, what we're going to do, we're just going to ask a few questions. And uh, I don't think you guys will be able to see too well on there. So I'm going to read out the, uh, read out the uh, questions for you. No, this is the wrong one. Sorry. Uh, one second. I just wanted to see. I think I just got the wrong one. There we go. Yeah, now we got the right one. Okay, so uh, the people on Zoom can also answer, but uh, I don't think you guys will be able to read it over there. It's not such a good uh, view. So I'm going to read it out. So, which way should the indicator face? The left elbow or the left knee when you're doing a peristernal long axis? In other words, should it face there or should it face there? What do you think? If you remember, sorry, left elbow. Left elbow. Other ideas, we have one left knee, one left elbow. Do I have anything else? Do I have another left elbow? Do I have a left knee? Everybody's just looking at me. No, that's All right. Are you not there? Sorry. Oh, okay. Left elbow, all right. Okay, so why we put that? When your patient is lying down, if you go towards the left knee, what's going to happen is that you're going to end up missing the apex. And you're going to get a more of a straight view, if I can put it that way. Uh, you're actually not going to see your left ventricle that well. You're going to concentrate more on your right ventricle. So you have to make sure that you concentrate by putting it on the left elbow. <laughs> Alternatively, you can put it at the right shoulder, but it's just that your image will get switched around. Okay. Uh, the most anterior structure that you see is the right ventricle or the right atrium? Atrium. Right ventricle. Very good. All right. Is it impossible? It's uh, the aortic valve is impossible to see. True or false? False. Yeah, we can see the aortic valve. It just depends where we are and where we are scanning. All right. Uh, oh, thanks. Somebody is voting. Uh, it's uh, it's a good view for assessing. Number one, is it a good view for assessing right atrial function? No, not at all. Left ventricular function? Very good. Yes. Is it a good view for assessing pericardial effusions? Yes. Yes. Is it a good view for assessing the aortic arch? No. No, not at all. Is it a good view for assessing the mitral valve function? Very good. Yeah, so it is. All right. And the best probe to use, would it be a linear high frequency, a curvy linear, or a phased array? Which do you guys think? So it's very good. Phased array would probably be the best. Okay. But you can use a curvy linear as well. The reason we don't use a linear high frequency is because a linear high frequency, although it will look into the heart, it can't see very far. So it might take you just as far as the right ventricle and the septum. Okay. But it may not take you further than that. Right? So pericardiocentesis. These are just questions. All right. You can tell me yes or no. Yes. <laughs> and can be done even by a fourth year medical student. No, oh. all right. It must be done by somebody who's experienced and by somebody who knows what they're doing. Is it potentially life-saving? Yes. Yes, it's definitely it's potentially life-saving. Is best done under ultrasound guidance, true or false? All right. Should be done for all pericardial effusions. No, 
that's false, all right? It shouldn't be done for all pericardial effusions. It's done for pericardial effusions with cardiac tamponade and potential for cardiac arrest, okay? Uh, that's just something to uh, legitimize the fact that we're getting CPD points, all right? Uh, <laughs> Okay, so if they ask me, well, how are you questioning people? I can at least show them this, all right? So now the question is, do you guys have any questions yourself? Is there anything that you all would like to know? <laughs> all, right. all right, the reason being that when they are actually following up beyond that, all right? So what happens is they, uh, you know how we started looking at the aorta? they continue to look at the aorta after that. So it becomes much easier for them on their ultrasound series to then follow the aorta upwards. Yeah, instead of having to switch it and things like that. And not only that, their series of pictures kind of follows that sequence, okay? The truth is that the brain is not actually wired that way. We don't actually see things that way. So what happens is we know that the apex is in a particular place and it's supposed to be like that. So when we place the probe like this, our brain kind of understands that that's where the apex is supposed to be. But truth be told, even if you do it the other way around, your brain will still pick it up. It's just that by placing it this way, your brain somehow picks it up a bit easier. Who studied this? Who decided this? I don't know. But for some reason, they decided that that would be easier for your brain. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Okay. So that was basically what it was. Okay. So thanks even to the guys on uh, Zoom. If you have any questions, now is the time to ask. Uh, anybody, you can switch on the light as well. If there's anything that you guys want to know. I know it seems like a lot. Yeah. Right. All right, so a severe pleural effusion, for example, let's go, where would we see it? Take this one for example. So this one is a little pleural effusion showing over here, all right? So if it's a severe pleural effusion, then you would do a lung view as well. So that would be either on this side or this side, depending on where you suspect it may be. Now this side is more likely to be on the left ventricle. So it's more likely to be on the left-hand side. You can see right pericardial uh, pleural effusions on that side as well. Yeah. It's not your main thing. You're not using this view to look for pleural effusion, but the reason why they show us is to make sure you don't mix up the two, if you get what I'm saying, All right? So let's say you see the descending aorta, you see the pericardium, you see that there's no pericardial effusion, but a pleural effusion, or you see that there's fluid you here, but you didn't realize there's a difference. You might try and do a pericardial synthesis on a patient who doesn't have a pericardial effusion, but who has a pleural effusion. So that's why it's important to know the distinction between the two, okay? Once you have a pleural effusion, there are ways to drain it under ultrasound. No doubt, and I'll show you that as time goes on. But for right now, we would then put our probe here, look for a pleural effusion in those areas. Yeah, actually, yeah. It's basically double the pressure that's put on. So you place, for example, an icy drain to get out or try and drain your, your pleural effusion as quickly as possible, and then see, do a pericardial synthesis as well, and then see how the patient responds to that. But most patients who present like that are already extremely sick. So there's probably some other pathology that's going on that we've got to look at at the same time. But immediately as a life-saving procedure, yeah. Well, no, no, I mean, it depends what the underlying cause is. You may be able to treat the cause, that's for sure. Okay, all right. Any other questions? Very good questions, very good questions. Anything else anybody else would like to know? Everybody happy? Okay, that's good. Anybody on Zoom? Any questions? Not really. Okay. All right, guys. So we'll end for today. Tomorrow, we're going to have a little look at our... We had to do a clinical audit. Uh, it's uh, for those who are joining us uh, for CPD points, you get an ethics point for that. Uh, but we're going to be discussing our management of diabetic patients and diabetic emergencies. So even though it's not a PowerPoint presentation slide, it's just kind of going through what we did right and what we did wrong. Um, but it's still a nice thing to see. So we'll have it tomorrow at 8.15. And on Friday, we're going to have eye trauma. It's a lot of lectures, I know. Eh? It's like being back at university. <laughs> In the hope that we learn something. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, no problem. Okay, thanks everybody on Zoom as well. Uh, oh.
somebody let me just want somebody asking a question oh okay no that's fine all right thanks doc okay all right bye bye